to do this argument to make this as simple as possible because there is uh, the, the the parts in green I think are as 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 odd as they may sound I think are pretty uh, uh, you know pretty hard to argue with I, I think they're just a pretty pretty uh, set um, the blue is kind of an optional thing and then and then I suggest some uh, some some wilder things that are you know uh, up for up for discussion. So, so, here's, so here's my argument. Uh, th there are, as we know, there are specific facts of mathematics. Um, these are properties of certain numbers. These are things like uh, you know, Feigenbaum's constant and uh, all, all, all kinds of th facts of number theory and things like that. Let's, let's, let's call them patterns or other people have called them forms. Um, and so, so here are some, some examples, you know, facts about what the amplitudehedron does and doesn't do and, and things like that, symmetry groups and, and so on. Okay, um, so, that's, so that's the first thing. So we know, we know that. We, we know this is the case. The second thing we know is that uh, there are many of these specifics that are, that are surprising and kind of forced on you once you choose some very basic assumptions. So, for example, my understanding, and I'm no mathematician, but my understanding is that uh, <clears throat> once you once you start with logic or set theory, you then can build up mathematics, and then you get things like the very specific value of e. You don't get a choice about it. You could you couldn't have set it to something else. Uh, one, once you start with some specific assumptions, now granted you could have started with other assumptions, but once you start with specific assumptions, you then inherit all kinds of actual facts that are what they are. You discover them, and there's nothing you can do about them. Okay, that seems that seems also to be true. <clears throat> now, uh, for some such patterns, there are aspects of math and physics that are explained by those patterns. So, for example, if you want to know why the cicadas come out at 13 years and 17 years, you're going to eventually get a story about prime numbers because they're trying to avoid predators, cycles, and things like that. So, the pattern that you see in biology, for example, is explained by the distribution of primes. Or if you want to know why certain particles do this or that, the answer is going to be, oh, because there's this group that has certain symmetries and the amplitudehedron does this and that, and that's why the particles are how they are. So, so it seems to me that if you ask why long enough, eventually you end up in the math department. Like you, you start in biology or you start in physics, and if you keep asking why, eventually it turns out it, it turns into some kind of mathematical fact. Um, however, in contrast, it doesn't work backwards. So, for example, if you wanted e to be different, or if you wanted Feigenbaum's constant to be a different number, there's, to my knowledge, nothing you can do in the physical world to change that, right? So the facts, these facts from the mathematical world, uh, affect what happens in. The, in, in the physical world, but the reverse is not true. You could, you could uh, change all the constants at the beginning of the Big Bang, and still the patterns of those Halley plots that I always show still look the way they look, and the facts of number theory still are what they are. There's nothing you can do in physics to change that. So, so it's interesting. If, if the facts of these patterns are, were different, biology and math would be different. Um, so in a, but, it, but it doesn't work in reverse. And so in a certain sense, you can say that causality flows from these mathematical properties to the physical world. And when I say causality, I don't mean in the physical, in the temporal sense of like, first, uh, first the A happened and it was the cause for B happening. I don't mean there's a sense of time here. I mean that if you want to explain what's going on in biology or physics and you want to, uh, better than explain, if you want to build new things, if you want to control what happens, you want to make new capabilities, you have to understand what's happening, what, what these properties of these mathematical objects are. That's, that's what I mean by, by causality. It, the, the, the properties of those mathematical objects determine what you're going to be doing uh, in the physical world. And so they cannot be ignored. These things <clears throat> play instructive roles and, and instructive in a very pragmatic sense is that you can't, you can't ignore these things. If you want to understand evolution, biomedicine, engineering, whatever, you're going to have to understand that these are inputs into the system you care about. Therefore, so okay, so so all of that I, I think uh, I, I think is pretty hard to argue with. I, I think those are things we know, but now it has some conclusions that with which people may or may not like. The first conclusion, it seems to me, is that physicalism is dead on arrival. It is it is simply a non-viable theory because there are facts that are simply not in the physical world in any useful sense of physics. Because nothing about physics, there, there, there are no theories of physics that will tell you why EE has the value that it has or why, you know, certain 
other um, abstract mathematical properties are what they are. Uh, these things are these things comprise a set of truths that are that are simply not uh, in the physical world. Pythagoras knew this already. Um, probably lots of ancient uh, thinkers uh, has already said this, and so Plato, of course, said it. And so for, for that for that reason, for the, I call the space of possible properties the Platonic space. But I want to be clear that I am not trying to stick close to how Plato thought about these things. In particular, I don't believe that these are. Um, Im Im immutable, unchanging, permanent forms and things like that. If I don't know if we really know what he thought about some of these things, but 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 certainly that's not what I'm trying to do. The only reason I call it Platonic space is to try to stick uh, close to the mathematician's view of what's going on and point out that this is already an existing view. I, I make this up, um, although I make um, a couple of changes in what I think are important changes to this. So, so that that part I think is uh, is what we can say pretty strongly. Um, uh, even in you know Newton's boring um, classical world with no quantum mechanics and no no, no weirdness, already physicalism was dead because the objects of that physical world had to obey rules that were not set in that world. So okay, now now here are some <clears throat> some optional hypotheses. So this is a metaphysical claim. I can't prove this, but but I, I think I think it's a good way to go because it's optimistic and it leads to research, which is that if we look at the space of possible patterns, this, so so this Platonic or latent space of patterns, I propose that we don't think that it is a random collection of facts that we just have to live with, which is what a lot of scientists say when, when, when if they want to be physicalists and I point out that, hey, how come, uh, isn't it amazing that, uh, that the, this, this thing has this, uh, this property? Why is that? And they say, well, it's emergent. And they say, what does that mean? And they say, well, it just means that it, it's just a fact that holds in our world. And that's it. We're going to build up a catalog of facts that hold in our world, and that'll, that'll be that. <clears throat> I think that's a, that's a pretty mysterious um, kind of pessimistic way of looking at it. I would rather think the way that many mathematicians think, which is that th this is not a random collection of, of facts. This is a, they, they form a structured ordered space, such as that, that when you've understood one, that helps you to move in some direction to understand the next one and the next one, that they come from an ordered, um, uh, systematically uh, in, um, tractable space of, of, of patterns. <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's, an, that's an assumption. You don't have to believe that, but I think all of all of science you know ha having a research agenda at all means that you've already bought into the uh belief uh, that that you're studying uh, a, a, a systematic a space of truths that makes sense of some sort that it has a structure to it okay so now from there uh i i will draw uh two two skeptical positions which i think are interesting the first position is that i don't think we can assume that the models of mathematics, which are specifically these kind of formal um, ways of understanding basically low agency uh, kinds of patterns, encompass everything that exists in this space. You could, you could say, I think mathematics is all there is. The, the only thing this space contains are the kinds of things that math is good at dealing with. But, but I think that's an assumption, and I don't think we can assume that. And, uh, and I'm taking the skeptical position that says that no, actually, maybe that space also contains other patterns that are more complex, uh, more dynamic, higher agency. And when you study those things, it doesn't look like math anymore. It starts to look like behavioral science. And that the, the formal tools of mathematics only apply to one layer of the contents of that space. But there are other contents that are actually better dealt with by tools that we recognize as behavioral science tools. So that, that is, a, is an empirical claim. We should find out if that's the case, and that's what we've been doing. And so, therefore, if you, if you uh, follow that skeptical position, you would say that some of these patterns that are, that are making their way into physics and biology actually look like kinds of minds. They, are, they actually look like behavioral um, propensities or competencies. They, are, they look like kinds of minds. They don't, they don't look like just the properties of mathematical objects. I'll, I'll parenthetically pause and, and just point out that um, there are a couple of engineers and mathematicians at our um, Platonic uh, space uh, uh, symposium that we have that, are pointed out, that have pointed out to me that 
even the assumption that the mathematical objects are low agency tools is a bad assumption on my part. And that actually in their own space, those things may have more on the ball than I give them credit for, which I totally uh, think is possible and is completely consistent with my idea that you can't just decide these things, you have to do experiments. And so there's some very interesting work um, that, that these people are doing. So um, we, can, we, can we can link to all that. So if once, once we've said that there are patterns from this non-physical space that makes a difference in physics and biology, then what that means is that uh, dualism is basically viable. This is a model that's been, um, you know, kind of very unpopular in mod modern science. Everybody wants to have a, uh, a, a physicalist uh, kind of perspective where you don't have uh, this the influence from other spaces. But it seems to me that we already knew that some aspect of dualism was true in physics and biology because both of those areas get inputs from a space of patterns that is not the physical space. So we already, we already knew that physics and biology um, has, has this dualist aspect, but I'm suggesting it may also be relevant in cognitive science. In other words, some of these are not just patterns of uh, form and, and, and function, they're also patterns of behavior. So these are also kinds of minds. That gets us closer to the original dualist model by Descartes, and <clears throat> at least in, in the West, um, it was the original one. Uh, and, uh, and, and so we can, we can talk about that. And, uh, and the, final, the final skeptical position that I want to suggest, which again is independent from, from the others, it's a separate kind of thing, is that I don't think we can assume that biological materials, evolutionary processes, etc., have any monopoly on hosting the ingression of these patterns. In other words, we can all see that complex biology is really good at taking advantage of these spaces, uh, the, 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 sorry, the patterns from, these, from this space, but I don't think you can assume that there's any magic in the complexity and the biological materials and the random search of evolution. I don't think you can assume that any of that is essential for this. And for that reason, it might, be, it might behoove us to look at a simple, model, simple model systems, AKA machines, algorithms, things like that, to see if they also host some ingressions, uh, maybe not as maybe not as uh, as complex and agential as what we see in biology, that would make sense, but still not zero. And so <clears throat> we've done experiments in this space, and in fact shown that even extremely minimal deterministic uh, kinds of things actually do become the the interfaces for these intrinsic motivations uh, of behavior and, and and these these patterns in general that are not just complexity not just unpredictability but actually well recognizable cognitive competencies so so that's my that's my simple argument um, about the space about the you know where these patterns come from and some optional um, sort of some some optional implications what I have after that are basically uh, a couple of things, just just a couple of summaries of the talk. So so I'll, we'll we'll point you to a to a long um, talk that I gave on this. But the summary of that talk is that these patterns of form and behavior are ubiquitous. These patterns actually serve as uh, uh, cognitive targets or goals for all kinds of agents, problem solving competencies, that physics and genetics and this notion of emergence, which I think just basically means surprise, is insufficient to really take advantage of all this. Um, and that uh, especially the novel forms that we and others have made, the xenobots, anthropods, all that stuff, are, uh, cannot really be well dealt with by using the kinds of things that biologists are used to, which is, which is history of, of selection. And then there are all sorts of um, speculations and implications which I have I've uh, said at, at one point or another, uh, I think that I think that all physical objects, and that includes machines, cells, embryos, cyborgs, swarms, robots, AIs, all of it, uh, human bodies, other bodies, all of it, are basically interfaces. They're pointers into that space of patterns through which these non-physical uh, non-physical patterns ingress into the physical world. I think evolution exploits the heck out of these, th these the, the, the fact that you get more than you put in. That's kind of the whole point here is you make an interface and you spend some amount of effort making that interface, but the kinds of, then the patterns that ingress through it provide massive functionality beyond what, what you've done. And I think that physics is what we call the things that are constrained by these patterns. So when we say the fermions do this or that because of some mathematical property of some kind of structure, that's a constraint. 
But biology is what we call the things that exploit these patterns. They're enabled by them. They do new things because the patterns are coming through. And I don't think this magic is quantum, although maybe quantum biology puts new bells and whistles on it. I, I have no idea. But uh, I think already uh, the classical world um, uh, was already informed, which I think is, 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 is funny, the, the, the word informed, uh, by the truths of mathematics, uh, which, which are kind of uh, we, we, you know, determining what's, what's going to happen. And finally, I think that the mind-brain problem really is the same as the math-physics problem. So in exactly the way that physical objects are haunted by these weird patterns that don't come from the physical space, I think brains and bodies in general are front ends, they're thin client uh, interfaces for the actual, um, the, for the real show, which is, which is the patterns from that space. And I think we are the patterns. In other words, I don't think we are physical bodies that are occasionally subjected to various forms coming through. We, we, we are the forms. And, and um, our minds, maybe that's what consciousness is, is the view from the platonic space outwards. Uh, we are the patterns looking out into the world through these through these various um, through these various interfaces, and then we can talk about uh, what this means for for reasons and causes and, and and free will and stuff like that. And then the final thing I'll just say is that what I think is important about all of this is that it leads to a a practical research program, right? So my goal is is not to only do philosophy. This this has to this has to impact the the empirical uh, sciences, and so this is our research program. You know, we're building new interfaces to try to understand um, what forms are coming through. We use these interfaces as vehicles to explore the space. We want to understand by via rigorous mapping the properties of the pointers we build and the patterns we get. So when I make a xenobot or I make an anthrobot, and the anthrobots have four types of behavior and the xenobots uh, have this many new gene expressions and they do kinematic replication, we need to be able to say why. Why is it that we're pulling down these specific behavioral propensities once we've made a certain interface? We're doing a bunch of work now on the compute side to quantify this free lunch aspect. So when you've made an interface and you're getting a bunch of ingressions through it, it's pretty clear to us that you're getting more than you paid for in the physical world. How, mu how much more? So, so we're actually trying to quantify that. Are we getting free compute actually, which I suspect we are. Um, we're trying to understand the metric of that space. Is it, is it dense? Is it sparse? Uh, why, you know, why, why is it under positive pressure? Why are these ingressions uh, so, uh, so eager to come through the, um, the interfaces? Um, and, then, and then these other questions that are much harder to address, like I don't think these patterns are purely passive. I don't think they're eternal and unchanging. I think there is some kind of, for lack of a better word, chemistry of a dynamic that they do on their own in that space in parallel with whatever they're doing through the physical interfaces. So I think there's actually action on, 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 both, um, on both spaces. And then, and then there's some other stuff. 